and welcome to our first class on the history of Hinduism. Uh, we're going to kind of take these great religions uh, in as chronological order as we can. Now, they all still exist, so we're going to take the ones that were the first to start. And even then, it's kind of a guessing game with some of them. Um, especially when you're talking about the very oldest. Is Hinduism the oldest? Is Judaism the oldest? Well, if we were to look at the religion now and how it is practiced now, we would have to say that Judaism is has a much later start date than what Hinduism does. Because in Judaism, as we'll talk about when we get to it, it went through a whole lot of changes. It wasn't always the belief in one God. There were several gods. And in fact, as I think I told you, in the earliest part of Judaism, and it could really hardly be called Judaism at that point, we could just call it the Hebrew religion, that not only was there God, Yahweh, but Yahweh had a wife, Asherah. And that held on for a good little bit. Um, but eventually they started doing away with the other gods and concentrating on, on the one god, Yahweh. Um, so when we talk about there being uh, Judaism being a monotheistic religion, actually we should probably use the word henotheistic religion, meaning there are more gods but they have chosen one. Well, you start thinking about the scriptures, and why would the commandment say, you shall have no other gods before me? It doesn't mean ahead of me. It, the word actually, uh, the Hebrew word means in front of my face. Don't you dare have a, another god in front of my face. Uh, if you got another god, better hide it. You better not let me see it. Um, and there were... Uh, Oh, so many, so many other scriptures we can look at, and we will, uh, that talks about, you know, you are the most high God. Insinuating, there are other lower ones, but Yahweh is above even those. But we get to the point where they will kind of pare all that away, and they will be a, a, a belief system of only one God. They won't be thinking about so many others. Then you get to the Middle Ages, though, and you have this um, mystical text called the Kabbalah, and they start bringing up some of those old beliefs all over again. You know, 1,500 years after they had threw, thrown it aside, they start to pull it out again. But when we look at conservative or orthodox Judaism, or, conser or, or even... Uh, um, conservative, orthodox, and reformed Judaism. Um, all of them have kind of left that stuff by the wayside. Well, but tonight we're talking about Hinduism. Now, the earliest uh, reaches of Hinduism um, has been the hot topic of debate among religious scholars for a long, long time. Um, first, there wasn't any real Hinduism in the modern sense of the word way back. There were things that led up to that. There were things and, and certain philosophies and certain beliefs that fed into what would become Hinduism. But a lot of it beforehand was kind of um, dependent on where you were. Now, here's the thing. In a class I had on comparative religion, my professor told us, first day, don't ever forget that Christianity was born in the lush river valley of the Jordan, and Islam was born in the harsh, unforgiving desert. And that, he said, is all you need to know. Well, I thought, great. No more class. Well, the rest of the class was simply developing that idea that our surroundings did so much to make us how who we are, how we believe. And even now, um, 
we, we hear about people who will convert to another religion and you just kind of go, why? You don't have the cultural vocabulary to do that. Uh, when I was in college, uh, 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 a guy in the <coughs> class, the, the professor asked us, uh, tell us what your religious tradition is. And uh, so we all know what viewpoint we're coming from. And this one guy says, I'm a Japanese Buddhist. The professor said, really? Do you speak Japanese? Well, no. Then you can't be a Japanese Buddhist. <laughs> and he was like, well, sure. I believe in the thing. No, if you don't know the words and you don't comprehend the words and the meaning of the word, how can you say you adhere to this belief system? And uh, he said, our religion is, is a cultural springboard um, that if we were born in Saudi Arabia, we would all be at least born Muslim. If we were born in India, chances are we would be Hindu. If we were farther north, maybe Muslim, maybe Buddhist even. But depending on where you are, it's a cultural thing. It's a family thing. Now, you can choose whatever you want to later on and move on to, to another religion, but it's our culture that shapes us, the things that we hear. You watch television, and uh, I was watching it with my oldest boy one time. We were watching MASH, and uh, I said, I want you to listen in this episode, on well, any episode, but this one, I want you to hear, are there any references to Shakespeare or the Bible? And he was like, Get out of here. In MASH, watch. And he wound up counting three scriptural references and one Shakespeare reference. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you want to understand modern culture, modern American culture, you have to know the Bible and you have to know Shakespeare. And if you want to know Shakespeare, you have to know the Bible and you have to know mythology, Greek or Roman mythology, because all of those things is, are what played into it. The same is true. Um, whatever other country you go to, when I spent time in Japan, and there would be references, I would go, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, what's so funny? And everybody else is laughing. What's so funny about that? Oh, it's a religious thing, my friend told me. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then. Um, not that interested in the joke to want to convert, so uh, you know, just, just let it go. Um, so... We start looking at, at the, these early traditions, and these early traditions and the early sources in Hinduism are very, very old. Um, and really, if we're truthful about it, Hinduism isn't really like one religion. Well, think about Christianity. Is all Christianity the same? Absolutely not. Uh, you, you take a, a Southern Baptist, and put them in the same room with a Roman Catholic, they might not necessarily get in a fist fight, but they're not going to agree about a whole lot. Especially you start bringing up the saints, or you start bringing up things like uh, the infallibility of Scripture, or something like that, they're going to argue. Well, for crying out loud, even among the Lutherans, there's how many of, what is there, four, five? And, and that's just in America. Well, there's more than that in America. Is there? All right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's the radical bunch. Then, among the Baptists, Southern Baptists, American Baptists, Independent Baptists, Free Will Baptists. Um, yeah, and I think down in, uh, uh, over in Thorpe, there is a faith-free Baptist church, which always cracked me up because I faith talked free. to one of the guys there, and I said, what, you guys got no faith? <laughs> What? what are you talking about? Well, it says you're faith free. Isn't that like sugar free? <laughs> you guys don't have any faith. We got faith. And he gets indignant about it. I said, easy. It's a joke. It's, it's just some people cannot laugh about their religion. Um, so what is there? Uh, I think an estimate was that there are 33,000 Christian denominations. Goodness gracious. Um, of course, the old joke is, this guy's going to jump off a bridge. He's standing up there on the bridge. It's dark, and a guy sees him. He gets out of his car, and he goes over, and he goes, Man, what are you doing? He says, I don't have anything to live for. Of course you do. There's plenty to live for. Hey, hey are you a Christian? Yeah. I am too. We got that in common. Well, what, uh, what denomination are you? 
And I says, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. Me too. I'm a Baptist. Yeah, we got that in common. We, we've got something. To, well, well, you know, are you a American Baptist or Southern Baptist? I'm American Baptist. Me too, the guy says. This is great. We have a lot to talk about. Well, what conference are you from? The guy goes, New York Conference. Me too. Well, Eastern or Western? The guy goes, Western. He goes, oh, die, heretic. <laughs> <laughs> so close. <laughs> uh, so Hinduism is much the same way. It's actually a large amalgamation of several different uh, belief systems. Loosely putting them all together as Hinduism, I mean, it works, but when you talk about the actual practice of Hinduism, they all act kind of differently. Some will actually venerate the cobra, for crying out loud. Now, that gives them something in common with the snake handlers in Tennessee and Kentucky, and maybe we should get the two of them together and see how much they, they have in common. Um, you have those who, who worship not worship, let's say venerate, even certain objects. And when we look at some of those objects, we can see how ancient the thing is because it's not much more than a shaped stone. Well, uh, then when does Hinduism actually begin? When can we say this is the moment all of it comes together to form Hinduism? Well, even that's kind of hard to do. Uh, we can start seeing texts start to come out. We can start seeing temples being built. We can start seeing things like that that mark a religion. We can see when those things began, but what was there before that? Well, that's all. not always uh, easy to pick out, too. All those traditions that kind of merge together and flow into his, Hinduism may go back several thousand years and probably do. Um so the uh, uh, and some Hindu worshippers will say that Hinduism has always been. Well, all of our religions want to believe that. Um, no, all of them have a starting point. And even before the starting point, there was something else that led into it. Archaeology has done remarkable stuff for us that even before some of these religions began, we can see what was like a prototype of the religion, something that was had been worshipped beforehand, or and in fact, at a place called I'm going to say it wrong, Gobleki uh, Peku, I think. Uh, anyway, it's in modern day Turkey, and it's considered one of the oldest structures in the world, believed to have been built around 10,000 BC, and they have determined it was a temple. So how remarkable that when we start building. First thing we start building are places of worship, at least as far as we know right now. Um, you know, were there houses and mud huts before? Yeah, but those haven't survived. This thing has survived, uh, and it's a it's a remarkable thing. You can you can find it on on Google. Um, just look for something like oldest building in the world, Turkey, and you know it'll come up. Um, now, here's the thing that. It, it, Nicole showed it to me the other day, and I said, crying out loud, this guy is practically just given the introductory lecture that I was going to, to give here, and he's talking about, he says, there's only really two religions in the world. Mm, okay. Well, what he meant was, in the West, we'll say, that is like, take it from Persia, or Iran today, westward, and then starting at that same point and going eastward, Afghanistan we'll say, going eastward, the religions, no matter what we call them, they all have very similar markings. Western religion, Christianity, uh, Islam, and Judaism are all concerned with looking up. That's a very simple way of, of saying it. Saying that we, we look toward a God who is above us, who takes care of us, who watches over us, and we are continually, <coughs> three religions, are praying 
to this God above, outside of ourselves, looking for God to send us wisdom, to send us guidance, to protect, to provide, to do all those things. Absolutely common among the three religions. Now, what the three religions call God, how they worship God, is very, very, very different. But the ethics winds up being very close to each other too. Now, you go over to the Eastern religions and you're starting to look at things like, well, Hinduism, then Buddhism, then Confucianism and Shinto and things like that. And there is no looking out or looking above. It's all looking in. Each of those religions is more concerned with personal transformation and looking to develop the self. Take Shinto, for example, in Japan. In a Shinto, a Shinto shrine, there's only one piece of furniture. It's a mirror. And the devotion is our spiritual quest is to polish that mirror until we can see ourselves more and more clearly. In Buddhism, Buddhism really doesn't even believe in a soul. It just believes in this life force that gets passed like a candle can pass a flame from candle to candle. This life force gets passed from person to person. And that's why the person is not aware of where they've been before, what life they had lived before. It's called reincarnation, right? Uh, the Buddhists say, yeah, we can get passed along like that, but what we want to do is blow out that flame, snuff out that flame of existence so that we don't get reborn again. Okay. Um, so that's what they call nirvana. Nirvana is not heaven, not in any sense of the word. Nirvana is just simply being, like that candle, being blown out so that we don't have to keep repeating the suffering of life over and over and over again and can finally be blown out and become one with the universe or whatever, or just simply go away. Um, there are many people I would like to go away. Um, <laughs> but they're not, they're not Buddhists or Hindus or any of the rest of them, and so... Yeah, we got to tackle forgiveness. Yeah, we, we got the burden of... You can have your suffering in Hinduism. We have forgiveness we have to deal with. Um, so in Hinduism now, they, uh, they do have this emphasis on personal spirituality, no doubt about it. Um, but there are also social elements and political involvement and things like that. Um, they We can look at... The empires of India, for example, the Mauryan Empire, the, uh, the, the, well, there were so many others that were, I forgot the map. Oh. Uh, I just realized I was going to, I was going to refer to this map where it shows what the migrations into India looked like. And this could be a surprise to you that in India, many thousands of years ago, the people who lived there were called the Dravidians. Um, they were the, the what we would call the Aborigines, I guess. Um, I don't like to use that word a whole lot, but they were the indigenous people of, of, uh, of India. Well, along comes these migrations out of Central Europe, I mean, out of Central Asia, but even before that, they were coming out of Europe. They were the Aryans. A-R-Y-A-N-S. Now, that word may strike a horrifying bell because the Aryans is the race that Hitler wanted to proclaim to be the master race. Well, these same people, the Aryans, long before Hitler, they wound up migrating through Central Asia and then going down into India and wound up pushing the Dravidians farther and farther uh, to the south. So what we have is this ruling class, and they brought along with them a certain social status, social strata, I should say. They had a class system that will wind up affecting the development of, of Hinduism in, in all kinds of incredible ways, and we'll get there. Um, so we have this migration coming out of Europe that makes it all the way to, to India, um, so 
you can, like so many places, you can see differences in skin tones. You can, even in Japan, we think of all, all of Japan being <coughs> one skin tone, they're not. There are those who are the, the more native uh, Japanese people, and then there were those who were <coughs> from the Chinese migrations and invasions who are fairer skinned people. Um, and every place you go, you can find, call it darker, redder, blacker, browner, anything like that, and always this mix or not going on with the lighter skinned people. It happens all over the place. Um, so, in India, we see the same thing kind of happening. And there are those in India who are very dark skinned, and then those who are very light skinned. And you wind up listening to some of them talking, it's like they have a British accent almost. Um, because, you know, English is an official language. Hindi is the other uh, language there. So, these people now are being affected by the migrations that have come in there, they're being affected by weather. And, you know, in, in the, the Arabian Peninsula, you're not really going to have a storm god. <laughs> Don't need one. Um, no storms to rest, and storm maybe. Um, you go to other places in, and, you know, but you have in India, you have the monsoon season. Well, then there must be some deity who's in charge of that. Um, and like we talked about last time, so many of the early gods, deities, are based on the weather. Thor, you have the storm god, thunder god. Um, you have uh, Baal in the Old Testament. We read about Baal, who was actually a Canaanite storm god also. So that's kind of the beginning of so many of them. They will change and they will move along into and become other things, but they always have a start with their nature religions. Um, so we look at uh, having a hard time to, to date the development of Hinduism, and we can't put specific years on there, but we can make certain time frames, and that's what I included on your first thing, um, is uh, we have these certain... Sorry. What have I got? Is it seven. Sorry. Uh, seven time frames. The first one, the Indus River uh, civilization, that's sometime before 2000 BC. Um, it's, uh, it's the beginning of those certain <coughs> empires. It's the beginning of those certain kingdoms that begin to grow up. And of course, almost all the civilizations that start are all going to start along some river valley. Um, and you have the Yellow River, the Wang Ho in, uh, in China. There's the Indus River Valley here in India. There's the Nile. There's the Tigris and Euphrates River where the Babylonians and <coughs> Assyrians and all the rest of those were. Um, you can now go over to the New World too, to South America, and you'll see development along the Amazon River and all of its tributaries. There's so many uh, uh, archeological sites that have found along the Mississippi River, along the Colorado River, along all these other rivers, the Columbia River up in the Northwest. We gotta have water. And so it's much easier, well, it's easier to travel. It's easier to, to transport goods and, and whether or not you're wanting to bring logs from trees from a far different place or or sand from a different place or silt or whatever. Yep, rivers are a great way of transportation uh, and a great source for food too, as a matter of fact. So the, uh, but when we're looking at the Hindu ideas of time, even talking about time itself, um, they believe that time is a wheel. It's cyclical. It goes over and over again. Um, kind of like the four seasons. Um, they are uh, not Frankie Valley and the singing. <laughs> uh, the, that there is a, like the seasons come and go, so does time come and go. And I'm talking about big time too. Not just <laughs> yearly cycles, but the life and death of the universe 
is included in their cycles. Um, they have, uh, uh, they talk about the, the different ages, and so many of their ancient texts will talk about those different ages. They refer to them as the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Copper Age, and the Iron Age. Um, yeah, Golden, Silver, Copper, Iron. And during the Golden Age, it said, and of course, Golden Age is always a long time ago. Doesn't matter what culture we're talking about. The good old days. The golden age was way back uh, when everybody was pious. And uh, and everybody observed, here's the first of our words, the Dharma. D-H-A. Don't think I did. The Dharma, uh, D-H-A-R-M-A, is basically the universal law, but it's also individual for us, too. We have a certain destiny. <coughs> there is a thing framed for us that we have been appointed to do. We are going to follow along like that. And um, in fact, one of their great books in Hinduism called the Bhagavad Gita, the whole story is about this prince named Arjuna who has to go to war. And he doesn't want to go to war. And he's sitting on or standing on his chariot and his chariot driver is actually the Hindu god Krishna in disguise. And so Krishna, Arjuna doesn't know it's Krishna. Krishna says to Arjuna, the prince, so what's what's your problem? What's what's the trouble here? What's what's got you so unsettled? And he goes, I don't want to go to war. I don't want I don't want to be a warrior. I don't want to kill people. I'd rather I'd rather do something else, anything else. Why do I? And so this whole long discussion is about the meaning of life. Why do we have to do the things that we do? And eventually, when he goes, why do I have to go to war? Our, uh, the charioteer, Krishna, says the answer, it's your dharma. It is what you have been appointed to do. You were born into the ruling class. You are a prince among your people. Your people have been threatened by another power, and you have to go to fit. It is the law of your life that you have to go to war. You may not like it, but that's your dharma, and you got to do it. Well, all of that has to do with the good things that we do. Now, you've heard the word karma before. Um, and karma is basically the acts that we do that fulfill the law of our life, dharma. If we do things right, then we have built up this good karma so that when it comes time to be reincarnated, you can come back better than you were before, in a higher class than you were before. You might come back into the aristocratic class or if you're an aristocrat you might come back into the priestly class or you didn't do so well you could come back as a commoner or an untouchable one of those people who you're not even allowed to bump up against them they are the ones who have the terrible jobs of cleaning up the refuse from the streets they're the ones who have to take away <laughs> dead bodies and nobody can touch them. And if you do happen to touch them, you got to go to the temple and have yourself purified. But you could do worse. Hard to believe. But you could come back as an animal. We always wonder, how come they're vegetarians? It might be Uncle Billy in there. <laughs> you don't want to have that hamburger. There's talk about bad karma. Um, and you could come. You could come back actually as a demon. You could come back as. Now you got to really be bad. You could come back as a rock. Now at that point, I don't know where you go from there because I don't understand how you can be a good or bad rock uh, accumulating any kind of karma. I think once you hit mineral life, you're kind of stuck. Um, there's, there's no getting out of that stuff. Um, so, the, but all of this time, and all of the, in, in this golden age, everybody was following their dharma. Everybody <coughs> was, uh, uh, was pious. But that starts to wear away over time. 
then with every age that follows, the good qualities in us start to drift away bit by bit, start to weaken in us um, until we reach this current Iron Age, Dark Age, they would also say. Um, uh, they call it Kali Yaga, no, Kali Yuga, uh, this Dark Age where we're not that great. We, there's all kinds of crime. There's all kinds of, of other religions would call it sin that are going on. It's an age that's marked by hypocrisy and cruelty and materialism. Um, everybody's wanting to accumulate, grabbing more and more for each other. And in our, our lessons over the last few weeks in, uh, in our church services, it's been parables about not accumulating, but using the wealth that we have in order to help others. Well, that's kind of the central message of almost all the religions, is greed is going to get you. Greed is going to cause you to hoard to yourself. In our, in our uh, uh, last week's, or a week before, uh, the lesson was Jesus said, remember, you cannot serve God and wealth, right? The original text said you cannot serve God and mammon. Well, wealth is a, uh, it's a fine translation of it, but actually mammon was a literary figure. Mammon was one who could not accumulate enough. Think about uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. Going to make poor, uh, what's his name, uh, work on Christmas Day? You can't You can't go away. I'm not going to help you with anything because it's all about a cute. Oh, here's a better one. Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Simon Legree. Simon Legree from uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. This guy was a slave owner who was brutal to everyone, not giving them any treatment of humanity at all because he was always wanting to grab more for himself. That character, Mammon, was absolutely insatiable. And so, in Jesus' time, it was absolutely possible for a person to be owned by two masters. Not something we always think about. We always thought that you, somebody bought you and you're stuck there, or somebody captured you in warfare and and there you have it. Actually, you could be shared by a different, it, sometimes it could be a cook who is going to go from one house to the other. Sometimes it could be a tutor who is going to be owned by uh, uh, two families who were wanting their children instructed that way. There were all kinds of things that could have been done, uh, all, all kinds of tasks and jobs. So Jesus is saying, but these two, these two, God and mammon are so opposed to each other, you cannot serve the two of them. You're either going to one love, uh, love one of them and hate the other, or you're going to despise one and cling to the other. You can't do both. You got to pick, which is why the rich young ruler goes there and says, What do I got to do to be perfect? And Jesus says, Sell everything you got and come and follow me. <laughs> can't do it. Sorry, Jesus. Can't do that. And he goes away sorrowful. Yeah because he can't serve them both. Well, but keep in mind about that story. He's really not, uh, when Jesus is telling the disciples, you have to leave everything and follow me, you, you, you can't go back and say goodbye to your parents, you can't, you, know, you can't keep minding the store. He's talking to these guys who are going to be following him around Judea. He was telling Peter and, and, and Andrew, you can't keep up your fishing because we're going far away from the water. You, we're going to go places where... He wasn't telling all of us to sell everything, give it to the poor. We have to have a heart that is willing to do that. We have to have motivations that want to use what we have to help others. But nowhere is Jesus saying, even though so many people have wanted to do that these days, just leave everything and go sit on a mountaintop and contemplate life. All right, that's what you want to do. But Jesus was talking specifically to those people who were standing in front of him at that moment. If you want to walk the steps I, Jesus, 
walking around here around the year 30 AD, if you want to come walk with me, well, you got to leave all that stuff behind. It makes perfect sense. Um, we need to kind of stop spiritualizing some of these things that were actually practical guidelines. So here we are in back in Hinduism now. What seeing that? Waiting for that one, preacher. Say what? I said I was waiting for that one, preacher. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sometimes I <laughs> stop teaching and go to preaching. Um, in fact, my when I taught high school, my high school students used to. I could see them look, and I asked one of the students one time. I said, "What are you laughing about?" You know, we were talking about Napoleon or something like that, and they said. Yeah, it's always that minute we always like when you stop teaching and go to preaching. I'm like, really? <laughs> um, <coughs> so uh, every every age is getting worse and worse, they said. So what happens is that there has to come a rebirth even of the universe. And they have a God who will take care of that, who will destroy everything so that the world can be reborn. The universe can be reborn. Um, so, uh, then like we were talking about, we have uh, this early history this way. The, Sin the Indus River civilization starts somewhere around 2,000 or more. Uh, and really, probably farther back. Uh, 2,000 BC. In that civilization, based in the, the basin of the Indus River, uh, which flows through what is today Pakistan. Um, there was a time up until, what, 1959, 58, 59, when all of that was India. Well, guys like uh, 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 Jenna and some of the others were like, look, we need a Muslim homeland. And so there you go, you get Pakistan. Um, and so the Indus River Valley is running through that even now. Um, and they wound up developing a, uh, a culture themselves there that was really kind of kind of urban. It was a it was a city dwelling structure, a, a lot like the great cities of Mesopotamia, like uh, uh, Sumer and Ur and Ugarit and uh, Babylon, of course, uh, Nineveh, places like that. This was a city dwelling, a city building and city dwelling culture that they had as far back then. Um, there were, we've uncovered two great cities. One was called Mohenjo Daro and the other is Harappa. And these two were, were mighty cities. Um, and in fact, now they have even changed the name of the culture to the Harappan culture to refer to this, this civilization that was there. Um, and they had been destroyed a long time ago, um, but they've since been uh, uncovered thanks to archaeology. These, each of these cities, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, each one po was populated by about 40,000 people. That's big for the ancient world. Um, we won't see cities reaching a million for a couple of thousand years after this. Um, even Rome, around the time of Jesus, is still less than a million people. Um, still, all the lot of people uh, crammed in there. Uh, they had a, a pretty high standard of living. Um, they were uh, th they had these really sophisticated water systems too. Um, most houses had actual drainage systems and sewer systems. And we're talking two thousand BC and more. Um, was they this had in Pakistan then? Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Um, they had huge silos where grain was kept. Um, they had uh, uh, garbage chutes in the houses where you could actually just put it into this hole in the wall and it goes down to a certain uh, collection uh, spot. So pretty sophisticated stuff, really. When we think about anything 2000 BC, we basically think, oh, it was just a mud hut that had, you know, what is far back as even, um, I think 1200 BC, we have found glass windows. I say we, I was out there looking for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, archeologists have found, we as a civilization have found these these glass windows. Now they weren't like 
glass like this, but they were translucent and kind of thick, but amazing stuff that they had all this that we uh, <clears throat> definitely take for granted now. Um, the civilization was, was extensive. It started in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, um, all the way down to, to the coastal <laughs> regions, uh, all the way to near what is today the uh, border with Iran. Um, and we know that there are still cities there that have not been excavated yet. We know exactly where they are, but the government doesn't really want a lot of people in there digging around. Um, so we have that. Um, there was a uh, Oh, here's the thing, is that this culture, the Harappan culture, the Indus civilization, didn't develop because of contact with other civilizations. A lot of civilizations do that. The Nile culture had encountered those from the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley culture, um, usually because they were always fighting with each other. But here in the Indus River Valley, it, they're growing up independently of each other, independent of any kind of uh, contact. Um, so we know not too much about the religion that was developing here. We don't know too much about what their social structure was like or what their politics were like. Um, but uh, And we really don't even know the language. Um, there was one, but a lot of it hasn't been deciphered yet. The languages that we do know, Sanskrit and Pali and some of those languages, aren't going to come around for several hundred years yet. Um, but religion in this river valley seemed to be focused on temples. Um, there were temple rituals and there were ritual bathing uh, that took place. Um, and in fact, there was a huge bath at Mahenjo-daro. You know, when we always think about the Hindus and we see them bathing going down to the Ganges River. Well, that's actually a secondary ritual. The first of the rituals came from this bath, a ritual bath here in this city of Mohenjo-Daro that we're talking about. Um, we, uh, uh, but we found seals that have, uh, you know, writing on there. Just don't know what it says. Um, and the, um, the ritual bathing and all of that, we know that there was some kind of animal sacrifice that went on. But in almost all of the earliest religions, you almost can't have a religion without some kind of a sacrifice. Um, ancient religions were sacrificial religions. Um, you know, you had the, the oxen and the lambs that were slaughtered in ancient Judaism. Um, you had... Uh, you know, other stuff. Like, there was sacrificial uh, bulls uh, in Islam. Uh, and it was supposed to be used then after the sacrifice was it was supposed to be used to feed the poor, uh, this sacrificial bull. Uh, so in all of the ancient world, it keeps this sacrificial language. Even in Christianity, we wind up having this sacrificial language referring to Christ. Uh, Paul is trying to make Christianity understandable to the people that he's talking to, and so he falls back to old kind of language, like sacrificial language. That's the language they understand, and so Paul makes great use of that. Um, we found little figurines um, that, that they had carved that were obviously uh, supposed to be objects of uh, that represented some kind of a deity. There were Molten images, uh, there were molten images, carved images, uh, all like that, uh, sculpted images. Um, and there was uh, um, a bunch of terracotta figures, too. Now, only 30, 40 years ago, in China, they found this grave with the great terracotta army, where <coughs> this was kind of a... This wasn't a, a Buddhist uh, um, emperor, but he had some kind of a connection with this Hindu idea 
of needing something for the afterlife. And so he decides to have 30,000 uh, ceramic figures that were all buried around the emperor's tomb. That's an interesting thing about, about ancient, ancient, ancient burial too, is the thought that life somehow continues and we need to give them, the dead person, something to carry with them. That's why we have the pyramids and in the pyramids, there were chariots uh, inside the pyramids. There were all there was a lot of food kept in baskets in there. And woe be unto you if you're the Pharaoh's favorite wife because he wants you on the other side. And into the pyramid you go, shut the door and see ya. <laughs> Drop us a line sometime. Um, so, and, and like I told you, I think last time among the Neanderthals, they were actually burying them in these caves with fish hooks, thinking that wherever they're going, there's got to be fish. So they would actually, and the most fascinating thing is the fish hooks that were buried 20,000 years BC are exactly the same fish hooks we use today with the same kind of, they were mostly carved from bone. Um, but yep, it had the little barb on there for catching the fish. So yeah, um, fishing has always been important to us and they say you can't build a better mouse trap. Well, apparently we can't build a better fish hook either. Um, so uh, uh, all of these things were used to, to mark the passage of people who were going to go someplace else. Um, one of those figures that, uh, that we were talking about, they were, that were carved, um, actually depicted a battle between uh, these, uh, 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 a lion and a, uh, a Mesopotamian, um, well, he looks like Gilgamesh, uh, is what a lot of people think. Gilgamesh was this great uh, Akkadian story and Sumerian story from maybe 3000 BC, but that story and stories like that had spread as people spread. They carried their myths with them, which is why you see in so many places, even though the place never had a flood, they still know the flood stories. The flood story that we think about, and we had always been taught that this was a flood that covered the whole earth. Well, it did as far as those people were concerned. I mean, imagine if we're imagine if we're all sitting in here and the water starts coming in, and as far as we know, everything is flooded. When it may have only been Central Avenue that was flooded, but as far as we're concerned, all of our surroundings are underwater. There was evidence of floods uh, that were in. In fact, the the Black Sea is basically the runoff of, of a giant flood. Any place there's a river, there's flooding. The Nile River flooded its banks twice a year. All of these places had these great floods. But we have certain stories too, like think of Noah and his three sons and their wives getting on the ark. Well, in Chinese, the language that they, the written language is called kanji, that the, the Chinese kanji which is a pictogram, the Chinese word for flood is four people, I mean, sorry, eight people in a boat. <laughs> Maybe that's just coincidence. But still, it sounds an awful lot like the flood story that was told throughout the Middle East. And it wasn't just Genesis that recorded a flood story. The Epic of Gilgamesh had the flood story. There's, you know, many, many, many different places that had that. Okay, so, <coughs> pardon me. Um, the, the people of the, the Indus River Valley and later in Hinduism, they, um, they all had emphasis on ritual bathing, on sacrifice, and earliest was goddess worship. Pause right there. Goddess worship. Almost all of the ancient cultures started off with kind of a matriarchal priesthood. It was women who were priests. It was women who were, who were in many cases, even the political heads. Oh, why is that? Pretty easy, because it's women who give birth. And so for the ancient mind, 
this was some mystical, magical uh, uh, ability in the nature of women that there must be something really important. None of us would ever say that that's not true. None of us sitting here. Um, there, but but for the, think about the, the, the primitive mind. Well, she can give birth, but I can't. Must be something special there. And so, since women were considered the life gear givers, or at least the life bearers, then there must be something to that. So, women took the place as, as the spiritual heads. Um, kind of wish it stayed that way. Uh, it was only when the guys took over that, yeah, things took a, took a sour turn. Well, um, so the... Uh, uh, the, the whole idea of ritual purity and sacrifice and the emphasis on fertility was common to all the religions of the, of the ancient world, really. So the second period that we're talking about is known as the Vedic period. Um, in that period, well, there's two major theories about the about that period and how it developed in these South Asian uh, uh, traditions. First came, like I told you, the Aryan migration. These Aryans who came out of uh, who came to the the uh, um, Indus River Valley, and they called themselves Aryans, uh, which actually meant the noble ones. Oh, well, if you're going to give yourself a name, make it a good one. Um, they were the noble ones, which automatically tells those who are not Aryans, oh, well, so what? We're not noble? And that was the way it was put on the people who uh, followed after. They migrated into the subcontinent of India, uh, and they became the dominant culture, and Hinduism was uh, kind of derived from what they had brought in. Um, and it was recorded in some of the the, uh, the Vedas, which are holy books we'll talk about next time. Um, so it kind of combined some of the beliefs that they brought with them with some of the indigenous uh, religions that were or traditions or spiritual beliefs that were present when the people got in there. Then some say that all of this transformation um, on the Aryan culture, uh, that there was a development along the Indus River Valley that, uh, that said that this culture existed before the Aryans ever got there. That's, this is the second theory that we're talking about. Um, that, uh, that the culture that developed there was already well on its way before any such Aryan migration uh, or invasion. We'll stay with migration. It doesn't look like an invasion. It's not like destroyed cities. And you can always tell when there's a, a an invasion and a, a conquest by another country because the first thing that goes missing is metal. If you find a city that's been destroyed and there's no metal there, that was a conquest because the conquerors always want to take the metal melt it down, and make their own peculiar weapons out of it. Uh, so, yeah, you the metal missing metal will always be a sign. If you find metal there, then you can say it's something like disease or some environmental catastrophe or something like that. But, yep, that's the first thing archaeologists look for. No, no metal, conquest. Um, so, um, two things help us in studying this This second period, this Vedic period, which goes from 1500 uh, BC to uh, 500 BC, a thousand year period. Um, the uh, language and archaeology have done so much to help us figure out what was going on there. So we can say a couple of things about that. First, the language of this culture we now know is Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the, the, the language that all of the ancient documents were written in. Even some of the earliest uh, Buddhist documents will be written in Sanskrit. And Sanskrit 
it looks funny to us. It, I should have, again, given you a, an example of what it looks like. Does it look like any language we know from our European descent? Uh, it doesn't look like any African language that has been handed down to us. But for in a lot of cases, the African languages were all verbal languages. And some of the I mean, verbal meaning spoken languages, oral is the word I was looking for. I uh, had a friend who worked for a, goodness gracious, oh, Wycliffe, Wycliffe Bible Translators. And he was actually one who had gone into the Ivory Coast, I think, and they had a you know great language. They all spoke French also, <laughs> but their own language, it was only an oral language. And so he was part of a team that actually created an alphabet for that I'm like man that's that's fantastic work who wouldn't want to be a part of that that's going to create the written language that things can be written down in now well so Sanskrit it becomes one of those the very first in fact Sanskrit is going to predate even Hebrew um, Hebrew written as a language isn't going to occur for quite some time but it's going to happen there in uh, in the Indus River Valley with Sanskrit. Um, but my point was, this Sanskrit had been developing a long time. And if you were to look at the different uh, families of languages, we know that there is the, what they call, there's the, the Northwest Semitic uh, family of languages, which includes Hebrew and Aramaic and Ugaritic and stuff like that. Then there's the Central Semitic, which includes Akkadian and uh, uh, Babylonian. But there is also this family of language called the Indo-European family of languages, right? And from the Indo-European comes Italian, Romanian, French, Portuguese, German even, all of those come from that, but there's different families even in that family. But Sanskrit is an Indo-European language. It actually came from, like I said, from Central Europe. We know that now based on the family, based on the, the language that was used. We can see certain connections with European languages, which just is astonishing, separated by thousands and thousands of miles, that's what the immigration brought with them, was this great language. Um, and Sanskrit is a marvelous language. Um, it is descriptive, it is beautiful. Yeah, it, absolutely fitting for all the, the, the myths and the religious texts that follow after it. Um, so we, uh, um, but there's also an archeological uh, continuity in India from the Neolithic period or the New Stone Age, um, later Stone Age, uh, it, we can see development in styles of dwellings, in temple development, and there's, a, there's an absolute continuity there. There's no jump where we can see there was some kind of a massive destruction and a big gap between these archaeological finds and the ones that we find later. Nope, we can see development. Think about Troy. The city of Troy has nine different archeological levels, or the city of Damascus, I think has like 12 or 13, where it just shows a continual rebuilding over the top of the other city. I mean, when they t we talk about uh, that Heinrich Schliemann went and uncovered the city of Troy, the first question comes to be then, which level? because there were nine levels and he found the fifth level um, and beyond. So the, uh, the language and the archeology span helps us to really create a great timeline of watching the development of the Indus River Valley culture and of the religion of Hinduism too. So we take this period, the Vedic period we're calling it, and we call it the Vedic period was because that's when the Vedas appeared. Vedas were written texts. Um, they were composed around this time that talked a lot about sacrifice uh, and talking about sharing a sacrificial meal. 
which a lot of people immediately want to draw a connection and say, sounds like the kind of meal that Christians participated in. Not so much communion, but what was called in the early church the agape feast. Um, there was that same kind of a communal uh, participating in enjoying what had been sacrificed and then having that uh, shared together. Um, they, there was the development of many gods, devas, they were called. Uh, and, um, and the term sacrifice wasn't limited to just sacrificing animals, but throwing anything into the fire. You could you could throw animal parts, you could throw a whole animal into the fire if you want to. Um, you could throw you could throw milk in. There was one instance of somebody throwing butter into it. Well, it sounds like you're getting ready to throw something else in there because you got the butter now. But <laughs> but it's actually because the butter was so cherished that that was a big sacrifice to give it because it's not just the milk from the cow; it's also the work that went into it. And that became a big part of understanding sacrifice for them. Um, their rituals were very, very elaborate. And they're still elaborate today. I got to go to a Hindu uh, funeral one time. It was, it was amazing. It was just amazing. It was elaborate. It was, it went on for a good long time too. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, the, the rituals that were developed then have continued on with even some kind of elaboration, too. Um, they had, uh, again, these earliest gods. Well, one of the early gods was Agni, which is just the, the word that means fire. Well, this is the god of fire. Um, there was Soma, who was the god of uh, plant life. We get all kinds of things like thinking about words like Soma as being like uh, narcotics. Yeah, comes from there also. Uh, there was, uh, uh, goodness, oh, there was the warrior god, Indra, uh, who was kind of cool. There was the wind god, Vayu. Uh, there was the storm god, uh, Maruts. Uh, there was, um, oh, you know, talk, going back to the, to the wind god, um, there was also, uh, there's a great word in Hindi, and um, a friend of mine wrote this book. And in the book, he talks about encountering God in three characteristics. Um, he sees a, a, a young man who is obviously Middle Eastern, and he's got a carpenter's belt on. And I'm like, come on, that's a little on the nose, isn't it? I mean, you know, he goes, look, I just need to point out that this is Jesus. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, carpenter's belt. Got it. <laughs> it's not rocket science here. Okay, we got it. One of the things that he did was when he showed, portrayed God the Father, his words, was the guy, the main character of the story, hears this rustling around in the kitchen, and he goes in, and he sees this large black woman who is standing there cooking, and he says, who are you? And she says, you can call me Papa. This was how he encountered the father. And so he says, you're a woman. Papa says, I can be anything I want to be. All right, good story. Um, but then he encounters the Holy Spirit. And the, 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 it was a young Asian woman, probably from India, um, and uh, she said her name was uh, uh, Surya. And so I asked him, after I'd you know, read his book and everything, I said, okay, Surya, where did you get that name? It's a cool name. And he goes, oh, it's a Hindi word. He said, I asked a friend of mine who was from India, what are your words for like breath or spirit or wind? And he said he went through, there was about 16 of them. And this one, Surya, meant a wind that comes out of nowhere and takes your breath away. And I'm like, God, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. That was his description of the Holy Spirit. So with so many words for wind, you know, one of them's got to stick, right? Um, then there was, uh, 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 there was Rudra, who was, uh, you know, this, 
just terrible figure. There was the sky god, uh, Dias, um, which actually is from the same Indo-European root word as Zeus, the Greek god of the sky. Um, there was uh, Varuna, there was all these others, uh, and a god of, of um, the night, Mitra, and uh, there was the nourisher, there was the uh, provider, Vishnu, then there was this one, Shiva, who was the destroyer. And actually, they worship this destroyer god, and of course, that kind of makes us nervous anytime we hear about that, but the point was, they were looking inward that they wanted their own selfishness to be destroyed so that a new birth could take place where they were no longer selfish and cruel and hip hypocritical. And so Shiva was the one they looked to for this merciful destruction. That sounds a lot like the prayers of the, the monks and the nuns in the Middle Ages, destroy me so that you may rise up. Um, the psalmist talks about that too. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what, we will pause there. 15 after? Yeah. Uh, we can pause there, and next time we come back, we'll talk about the classical period of Hinduism. Uh, if you have any questions, I know, it's kind of introducing new stuff. Gypsies came from India, didn't they, originally? Well, they did. Uh, they were, yes, the, the the gypsies, the Romai, the all different kinds of names. Yes, they migrated. And a lot of people have proposed the idea that they migrated out of India because of the migration into India from the Aryans. Um, and so they wound up leaving there. Oh my goodness, they went through Persia. They wound up landing in Hungary for a long time. And that's kind of our most recent memory of them is, you know, the Hungarians. And we think about them being the victims of Hitler's Holocaust as well. It wasn't just the Jews uh, and the, the, the Russians and the Poles and the other Slavs. He went after the gypsies too. Um, and um, yeah, so they, uh, uh, they were out of India from a long time back. Yeah. Theirs was kind of a slow migration uh, into Europe. But, and the migration continues. They, they wind up being pushed out of every place where they settle. And uh, so they go into Britain. They come to the United States. They, you know, looking for a home. Is Dharma for us kind of like calling purpose? Absolutely. Same thing? Though? It is absolutely that. The, that we feel that, I mean, and Paul tells us that, you know, each one of us has a calling, you know. Um, and so, yes, it's the very same thing that, um, <clears throat> that the point is, you better find out what your dharma is. Because if you don't follow the purpose for your life, well, then that brings up the bad karma as far as they're concerned. Um, why would it matter for them that, like, why would it matter because they're really concerned about the next life, I would be probably a rock or a fish, or depending on how I live, then I might be a higher position or a lower position. Mm -hmm. If I won't even have any recollection of when I'm dead, why would it matter mm -hmm. what I'm going to be next? Ex well, because uh, I don't know, even if I don't know somebody, uh, I don't know this person, but you know what? I'd rather them be a... a a merchant than a slave. I'd rather him be a king than a, you know. But why would it matter if I won't even remember it? Well, that's part, that's part of their ethics too, is that even though you don't know, it's still for the good of someone else. In a way, I don't want to make too hard and fast a connection between dissimilar ideas here, but in a way, it's a lot like what we would describe agape. Is even though I'm getting nothing back from this love, still I will offer this love for the sake of this person. Uh, agape doesn't look for any kind of return whatsoever. Um, uh, in the same way, 
they would say, it's not about me right now. It's about that person, whoever it becomes. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. And even though they're not conscious, still, they're probably thinking, don't want to come back as a fish. <laughs> so, okay. so I want to, because those Neanderthals have got hooks. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> All right, then. Then we will see you in two weeks. What is that? The next week. Next week? It's October for uh, the first week of October. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Then we'll be on the first and third. Then we'll be yeah. back on the first and third. Hey, that's great. So it's the sixth. Well, it is for me. I don't know about you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. So next week.